Welcome to another episode of Immigration and Mobility Decoded. Today, I am joined by Cecilia Esterline and Matthew LaCord, both from the Niskanen Center. Cecilia and Matt, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Uh, we are doing this in person in Washington, D.C., your home home turf, uh, one might say. So excited to meet both of you in person, Cecilia. Uh, I know we did that episode last year. I believe you were guest three or four. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Early yeah. Uh, and your episode uh, did pretty well, got a lot of traction. Um, so excited to, to, to bring, bring you back on and Matt, uh, to have you on for the first time. Big shoes to fill here. Yeah. yeah. I was just saying that. Uh, we are a couple blocks away from the original Niskanen office that we had back in 2015 at a WeWork, which feels like uh, <laughs> kind of a thousand years ago in, in a different world. Yeah. So it's kind of good to be back hanging out here in a DuPont circle. Awesome. Well, well excited to bring you back to the to the area. Yeah, no, yeah, the WeWork, I mean, not only A2015, but also WeWork. Just look at where WeWork is at <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> uh, but speaking of uh, Niskanen Center, uh, Matt, I guess, can you just uh, you know talk a little bit more about your organization, the work that you do, um, and kind of where Niskanen, uh, what, what you adv advocate for? Yeah, so Niskanen is uh, nine years old now, uh, uh, came uh, to be in 2015. Um, we're a think tank and advocacy organization. We work on a range of issues, obviously. Cecilia and I are, are on the immigration team, which is one of our original teams at Niskanen. We also do uh, climate and energy work, criminal justice, um, issues around governance uh, and democracy. Uh, and, and we kind of have that blend of think tank and advocacy mm -hmm. group. So Cecilia will write... Um, white papers and do original research. That's more the think tank side. And then she'll hand that to me and I will take it to Capitol Hill and uh, members of the uh, executive branch and, and, and do advocacy and lobbying. And so we kind of have a kind of two tiered approach to our work. Um, our organization is about 40 uh, people nowadays and still growing. Um, just to, again, moved into a, a new <laughs> office downtown um, and and kind of excited about a lot of, you know, uh, uh, prospects for, for moving the issues that are important to us. Um, uh, obviously, there's a, a supplemental uh, negotiation happening right now on Capitol Hill when it comes to immigration. There are tax changes um, about the child tax credit that we're interested in. So our organization works on, on a range of issues, but we're, you know, our hearts are here to talk about uh, the issue of immigration. Immigration, there you go. And your official job title? I'm the deputy director of the immigration deputy department. Director. So if uh, you mentioned the, the ongoing negotiations going on in the center right now, uh, do you often hear from uh, the staff of, of Congress people coming to you asking for your opinions and how things can be done? Or, you know, should we do this? Should we do that? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to talk about this negotiation because every 24 hours, it, it feels like there's a new story about uh, things are about to fall apart or we're, we're like, you know, 20 minutes from a deal. And so I don't want to say anything because I'm going to then then be proven wrong um, about that specific uh, negotiation in the Senate. But yeah, I mean, we have built relationships over the years with members of Congress and their staff. Um, and, and, you know, what we always want to be is kind of an honest broker when it comes to the immigration issue. So we obviously have expertise and are happy to, to talk through the complicated issues of the of the day, whether that's employment based immigration on Cecilia's portfolio or humanitarian flows and, and refugee resettlement, um, which is more my uh, my domain. Um, but we always want to help staff think through the you know the issues that they're working on. So they have an idea for a bill. You know how can we improve that language and make that bill you know ten percent better? How can we uh, encourage them to work across the aisle to get something done. Mm -hmm. um, kind of constant conversation with staff on educating them about the issue, um, about the the kind of you know in the weeds policy and, and the politics as well. Gotcha, Cecilia, uh, you are the uh, immig an immigration re re research analyst. Uh, and how did you uh, get into the field, and what drew you to the employment based side? Sure. So I've been working on immigration for a while now, but from different aspects of it. Right out of undergrad, though, I worked at Fragman working on employment-based immigration and providing direct services to a company that was sponsoring individuals for L1s and H1Bs. And so I think that really gave me an inside look into how important these people are to the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. And it's something in immigration that's perhaps less controversial or less in the news a little bit. So it offers a lot of opportunity for across the aisle work and and just working with diverse interests that really want to make sure that we have the talent that we need and we are able to keep them here. Mm -hmm. I've always been curious, uh, you know, 
since you both are part of uh, Think Tank, how do you, you know, come come across a topic or decide what to invest your time and research and resources into? I think there's a few different factors that can go into it. One is a personal interest or something that might draw you to it if you've had an experience or you talk with someone who's directly affected by a policy that you might be able to look into or find additional information. Another is is perhaps it's driven by administrative or legislative interests. If uh, legislators are hearing from their constituents complaining about XYZ policy or the lack of workers or the lack of ability for someone to stay, whatever that may be, there are policy ideas that we can sit and brainstorm to come up with creative solutions that might be attractive to a broad range of interests. And so I think that it's a little bit of mix where you get to kind of research your own thing, but then also leverage that for strategic conversations with individuals who are interested in making a change and pursuing what they're interested in at this time also. Yeah, I would add that we, you know, we are still relatively new. There's so many organizations in DC doing immigration work that have been doing it for since before Cecilia and I have been born. And we're always interested in finding what is a gap in the the advocacy or research landscape? So people are focused on the border or people are focused on H-1Bs. Like where where is there not focus? Mm. And then how can we identify opportunities within that? And so I think we've had that mindset since we started and we, we still have that. So, you know, an example, a couple of years ago, um, Cecilia was really interested in, in Schedule A, which I know we're going to get into. Um, and there just really wasn't work happening on the schedule a front people were were aware of it you know but there wasn't research and there, there wasn't a uh, kind of advocacy push on schedule a we saw that as a gap and 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 sought to kind of plug that gap and mm-hmm. so cecilia published a research paper and and there's been a lot of work which you know we'll get into in this conversation on schedule a mm-hmm. since that um and so it's always about kind of assessing the advocacy landscape and where are resources not being used where they they could be used and how can we kind of plug those gaps yeah yeah i feel like some of the topics that we're going to talk about today are you know meet that definition where i'm only seeing it from the scan i'm not seeing it anywhere else and to your point you know you're not seeing it on the news because you're just not you're just like you said you're just seeing the border and yeah, other, yeah, yeah. other topics um but yeah no uh cecilia you you are uh you've uh, published quite a bit of uh, research in the last few months a lot of great great topics um, as part of the Immigration Idea Incubator Series, and we'll link all of uh, your research in the in the show notes. Uh, the first one I wanted to talk to both of you about is um, giving small businesses a special H-1B allocation. Uh, obviously, the H-1B lottery is coming up in March, um, and you know we all know the H-1B, only 85,000 visas, 20,000 are set aside for those with advanced degrees. Uh, very, very competitive. I was just talking with uh, in uh, immigration, a partner from corporate immigration partners, and I believe last year, it's like a ten to fifteen percent chance of being selected. If um, tech dominated, uh, a lot of STEM occupations are looking to get H one Bs. Cecilia, um, you wrote that you know small businesses. Uh, to get back to that, uh, creates two out of every three new jobs, and they account for forty four percent of all economic activity in the U S. Uh, but you argue that these businesses aren't reaching their full potential. How so? Yes, yeah, so I think that that's important to understand. When you talk about how tech dominated in the H-1B lottery, a lot of times what you see is that the vast majority of H-1B lottery slots end up going to a very small pool of big companies. And that's great because they are creating jobs and they obviously need those people because in order to meet the qualifications of the H-1B, they have to demonstrate that there is a need for them. And so I think that's important and it's not necessarily to take away jobs from those companies, but rather there are these smaller businesses, as you noted, that small businesses are creating, especially new businesses, I will say, new small businesses are creating a lot of new economic opportunities, and they're really important to our innovation as a country and something that we need to be concerned about. And so being able to bring the talent that they need or keep the talent that they need, because often they might need someone who's studied artificial intelligence. We don't exactly have people who studied their master's degree in artificial intelligence 25 years ago, Mm -hmm. because these are new fields that didn't exist 25 years ago. So making sure that we have the capacity to keep and retain people who are here now and also to create new visa pathways for the people that they need. 
I, I, that's really important because if a small business doesn't have the talent that they need, they will have to move elsewhere and they can move to Canada. They can move to, you know, another location that might have more favorable visa policies for them. A large company, if they don't get their all their slots in the H-1B lottery, they have the capacity to move that one person to Canada, for instance, and have them working remotely. But smaller companies don't have the capacity to divide their staff and have someone working from wherever. So I think that's really important that we recognize the value that small businesses are bringing and make sure that we create pathways. If it's not through a new visa pathway, but just acknowledging what we do have is the H-1B and making sure that we utilize it to the best of its ability. And that is making sure that small businesses are able to have that allocation. Maybe it's not an additional allocation, but um, similar to the advanced degree exemption, um, that they would have a similar allocation. So are you saying that uh, in, in your ideal, if you're if you were in charge, if you're if you could change the H1B system uh, to help small businesses, what would your ideal scenario look like? Yeah, so I think it's important to create some criteria based on the size and age of the organization, because across the U.S. government, there's not really a particular singular definition of a small business. Mm -hmm. It kind of depends on the industry and like the type of work that they do. So kind of coming to a conclusion about what a small business is and maybe putting a restriction on new small businesses that are creating the most jobs and then uh, being able to set those aside. Maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 5,000, whatever it is, just creating an exemption to make sure that they're given an opportunity to get the talent that they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a good, good call out because I feel like in the US when we think of small businesses, I think we tend to think of them as like mom and pop shops, but they're really always not. I think a small business mm -hmm. can be, you know, you can have like 50, 100 employees. Technically, mm -hmm. it's a small business. Um, so I think that is an, an important call out. Um, I guess, Cecilia, can you break down a little bit more uh, why, you know, just how, what small businesses are unable to do versus the larger companies, the larger tech mm -hmm. companies you mentioned, you know, they could, you know, find another uh, pathway, or if you're a larger company, you maybe have offices elsewhere. Are they just sucking up all the talent? Yes, yeah, so small businesses, they play a specific role in the US economy, of course, but I think it's also important to note what they uh, have in terms of business capacity. So one person out of an employment staff of 1,000 people, you know, if you have to move them to Canada or you can't get them here immediately, likely the one out of 1,000 is not creating the same amount of your business uh, that one person out of a staff of 10 would be doing. So if you are not able to access 10% of your staff because you are only 10 people in your organization and you cannot get the H-1B for the one person that you need, mm -hmm. that's a much bigger blow to the organization than someone who has 10, like 1,000, 10,000 employees. So of course, the small businesses are you know open to the same opportunities in terms of moving to Canada or other competitors that are eager to take in our talent. But for, you know, for smaller staffs that can be much more detrimental and, and can interrupt business continuity much more. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to recognize that there are limitations to what these organizations can do if they don't have the people that they need, mm -hmm. the expertise that they need, and they will find it elsewhere. And uh, we see that again and again, and that people will go where they need to go in order to get the, the talent that they need and the expertise that they need. And if they are fueling the innovation of this country, they're creating so many patents, they're creating so many new jobs. If they are not able to do that here, they will end up doing that elsewhere. And I think it's an important message to understand in terms of our future and um, who we want to compete with. Definitely. Matthew, do you think there is an appetite on the Hill in, in the administration, current or future, to modify the H-1B to help small businesses and or other industries or areas of the economy? Yeah, I think there's always interest in in small business, right? If you go to the Hill, small businesses have a pretty high a approval rating, right? Nobody wants to be someone who stands against small business. Um, I mean, we did just see uh, and Niskan and submitted a comment on on H one B, the new H one B rules, uh, which we can get into. Um, you know, Congress has never shown a ton of interest in engaging on the H one B. There's a couple bills that are introduced uh, every year, but this really seems like it is in the uh, domain of the administration. Um, and, and the answer I'm going to give on almost every immigration question is, is kind of wh where we started, which is like the focus is always on the border. And 
I think there's a lot of interest amongst a lot of people to think about legal immigration in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And that is a secondary conversation to the the first conversation, which yeah. is the border. And mm -hmm. and I think that we can make the best policy case in, in, in the world. And I think that there is a, a, a great policy case for, you know, revamping and modernizing a lot of our immigration system. And, you know, in, in a world of, of political realities, like the border is just always going to come first. And right. so... Uh, we, you know, assuming we have a, a, a border conversation and able to kind of strike something in a bipartisan way, I, I do think that there's a lot of interest in in taking our immigration laws from the, the you know, 1965 or 1990 uh, and updating them to today. Um, but we can never really get over that political concern, which is the, address the border and then move on to right, the rest of the right, system. Yeah. You know, as a potential optimist it's, it almost seems like if if and when that border deal bipartisan deal is struck then hopefully we can move on to the tackle something in the legal side yeah but you never know yeah i mean what we're always uh, uh saying to folks is like trying to get ready for a window that can open up and, yeah. and you know you never know when that's when that can happen mm -hmm. that could be in the aftermath of, of a border deal or you know, there was a lot of engagement on, on immigration issues during COVID. There was a huge bipartisan bill in the House and Senate on recapturing mm -hmm. unused visas that then would go to doctors and nurses. Um, this was a bipartisan effort, and, and that didn't exist before um, before COVID. This notion of um, the notion of recapturing existed, but to have a bipartisan um, level of support that we had was mm -hmm. new. Um, and and I think you know we spend a lot of time on on the hill and and talk to a lot of members who are really interested in in the Conrad 30 program which is something that we've done a lot of work on um, and this this is uh, you know healthcare uh, it's physicians in in rural and underserved communities something that everybody should be able to support mm -hmm. you know and we're hopeful that over the last couple of years there have been a few compromises that have kind of snuck through under the radar very small very narrow um, but are able to get to get through and hopefully Conrad 30 reform, increasing the number of waivers and uh, uh, and, and kind of improving that program is one of those that that can sneak through. Um, you know, that's not going to that's not comprehensive immigration reform. That's not going to you know change the immigration system um, uh, other than a slight tweak. But like everything is something mm -hmm. um, and, and always trying to identify where can we move even the smallest bill. The, the one a couple of years ago that we worked on that we're, we were happy about, the only immigration bill that passed in the last Congress was a, uh, a study that uh, the bill instructed the Department of Labor to study the barriers immigrants and refugees face in, um, in accessing uh, employment in the U.S. Mm. Um, and so we, we couldn't get a policy change. We could get a study. Yeah. But like that was, that was something. It's a meaningful step. That was something. Yeah. So want to hold that thought hold, hold the thoughts on the health care uh mm -hmm. real quick but i did want to just quickly ask you you mentioned that niskanen submitted a comment on uh h1b rule uh which rule in particular are you, are you referencing the modernizing h1b rule that came out uh i guess a few months ago now but the window closed in december for comment uh and what's uh what's your stance and Yes, yeah, so the comment has a lot of great changes uh, that I think have the potential to improve the program. And one of them that they addressed is the issue of fraud that was happening mm -hmm. in the H-1B lottery. And, you know, whether or not it was fraud, they have, you know, continued to do investigation into, but there were individuals who had, you know, 83 registrations submitted on their behalf. Right. Um, and I say that if someone has 83 job offers, they should probably <laughs> go to an O-1 visa because we have a, <laughs> a, a visa for yeah. extraordinary individuals. However, within the H-1B, one of the suggestions of the rule, if it is implemented, and we're not sure if it'll be implemented before this year's uh, registration or not, is that it would change the lottery from being registration-centric, um, aka every employer that is offering a job submitting a registration, mm -hmm and then them choosing based on those, it would change it to be beneficiary centric. So the employee would be the one selected by the lottery. And then they would have a bit more autonomy to say of the, you know, 
10, 15 employers, maybe 83, that have submitted job offers or registrations on my behalf, I can kind of have a little bit more autonomy to choose uh, where it is that I will go. And I think that that is a meaningful step. And if they're able to implement it, I think it could be really beneficial for both preventing fraud, but also providing a bit more autonomy to the individuals to pursue the kind of employment that is best for them and the best fit for their skills. It also improves some of the ability for beneficiary owners who are maybe a kind of owning a startup or part, partial owners in a startup to access the H-1B, which is also a meaningful step um, because we don't have a startup visa. Mm -hmm. We have an entrepreneur minor program, um, but providing that opportunity for startup owners and beneficiary owners to participate in the H-1B is really important. There are some restrictions on it mm -hmm. that in our comment, uh, we suggest that they remove or uh, adjust slightly in order to make sure that the program is able to be utilized fully. But um, it, it offers some great steps forward in, in improving the security of the program and, and making sure that the individuals who need to be in the U.S. and who are most desirable by the um, companies are, are able to get here. Yeah. You mentioned the startup visa. It really shows where the U.S. is lacking, mm -hmm. uh, that we don't have one of those. And, but you look to countries uh, like the U.K., I, I think Canada has one, if I'm not mistaken, and just the speed at which they're able to introduce and, and, and modify their immigration systems. And you're just like, eh, why are we so slow? But we know the, we, we, we know why, but <laughs> it's just stands in stark contrast. Um, going to the topic of healthcare, care, um, Matthew and Cecilia, um, Cecilia, you wrote uh, on the crisis of care work in particular, but I think we can zoom out to talk mm -hmm. about healthcare, you know, as well. Um, as of June 2022, 60% of nursing homes uh, were limiting new patients due to staffing shortages. Uh, and your research shows that almost 90% face moderate to high staffing shortages, despite an equal share um, offering wages and uh, bonuses. Um, can you break down some of the root causes of these staffing shortages? So they've existed prior to the pandemic. Um, the healthcare industry has had lingering shortages for quite a while. But of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we see that, you know, these staff are becoming overworked because they're having to work longer hours because people are now out having to isolate at home or, or whatever it is that the case may be. And a lot of people are having to stay home. Women, especially, who might be overrepresented in certain fields, are were returning and working, you know, going home during the pandemic because they were having to take on additional caretaking responsibilities or parenting responsibilities or taking care of their elderly parents during the pandemic. So you see an exodus from the population, both on burnout and based on people who were, you know, leaving the workforce to take care of others. And so immigrants historically are overrepresented in these fields. And so making sure that we have a pathway to get them back into that field is really important. Mm -hmm. And we've suggested a few ways to do that uh, through expansion of the au pair program that now currently only allows individuals to come to the U.S. to provide child care as a form of cultural exchange. And however, you know, also elderly Americans can also provide a cultural experience and in outlook into the U.S. and and into American life as well. So we've talked about expansion of that to elder care. We've talked about making sure that individuals who are already here are able to access work authorization promptly if they are eligible for it. And, you know, making sure that there's uh, barriers that, to entry that make sure that those who are qualified and able and willing to work in the healthcare industry are able to access those jobs. Did your study research or just general thoughts, um, do you think the pandemic pandemic sped up the crisis in healthcare and, o and overall uh, care um, in that demographically, we know that, you know, baby boomers are retiring in extraordinary numbers by the day. I used to work uh, prior to this current role uh, at a, a boutique uh, media company that specialized in reporting on home health care, senior care. And, you know, this is back in 2017, the signs are already there. But do you think the pandemic sped that up? And just the the sheer number of baby boomers retiring and going into elderly care. 
Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think we saw a lot of people retiring early during the pandemic, someone who was comfortable in their practice and suddenly had to implement all of these new rules or regulations or just had to be much more cautious of themselves getting sick. I think that that creates uh, a movement of people who are burnt out and mm-hmm. people who are ready to retire a bit earlier. So I, I think we saw that um, was very common during the pandemic and it, it you know accelerated what was already a growing problem. Yeah, and one of the things that we found in the research is that you know, a- as older Americans are, are retiring and 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 need healthcare, they were very clear in in survey results that they want to spend, uh, you know, their years in their home mm-hmm. in places that they're comfortable. They don't want to go to a nursing home or another facility. And so, you know, the fact that there is such a shortage of of elder care workers and, and those in the elder care space, and it's so uh, disproportionately. Um, uh, immigrant labor, um, like there, there is a need there, um, and and I think that we're hearing more and more from from everybody, from um, you know folks on on the hill to providers and other experts, more in the healthcare space of the need for elder care, and so. The, you know, the idea that we've been working on, Cecilia mentioned about, you know, expanding the J program to include elder care is one that we're, you know, encouraging the Biden administration to, to take on. Um, and, and it seems like a, a, a no brainer, um, you know, a, a, an opportunity for a program, the existing pathway of the J visa uh, to provide um, both cultural exchange benefits to those that are doing uh, to those that are going through the program and, and also providing, you know, health care and um, uh, um, and camaraderie with with those elder Americans who, mm. who are aging in their homes. Yeah. So we see that as kind of a, a win win and, and something that we're we're taking on uh, yeah. big this year. So can you both expand on on the on the idea of modifying the J visa to help alleviate the labor shortage in in health in in care and uh, how immigrants can utilize that? Why specifically the J visa in your proposal? Yeah, so the J-1 is utilized by au pairs, and some of us might be familiar as those individuals who come from abroad and they come here for a year, a few years, Mm -hmm. and work as childcare providers in the private homes of American families. And it's an opportunity for American families to have their child cared for at home and not in an institution. And it's also an opportunity for the individual who's coming to the U.S. to learn about American life and experience the American culture in the most intimate way possible inside the home of a family that, you know, they trust in and they're caring for the child of. And so, you know, we look at that as an opportunity because it is something that already exists and it can both fulfill the intention of the original visa, which is to provide a cultural exchange pathway and meet domestic labor needs. Mm -hmm. And it can meet those needs because we have a a a great need for elder care. And as Matthew mentioned, there is a desire for these individuals to stay in, at home. And so through the J-1, if it were expanded to allow au pairs to also provide elder care, then these individuals could come to the U.S. and live in work in the home of an elderly American. And through the experiences and conversations with that individual, they could learn a lot about American culture and about American life. And that would fulfill the cultural exchange component while also meeting the domestic labor need that we have. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a great opportunity if we were able to expand it. And we talk about a a gridlocked Congress Mm -hmm. that's that's struggling to do anything on the issue, right? This is something where where the administration could take steps on their own Mm. um, through regulation to change um, uh, and add elder care to the J program. And so any opportunity where Congress doesn't have to be involved is something that you know, anyone in the immigration space is is interested in working on mm-hmm. it, it, with a gridlocked Congress, Republican, Democrat, the, like movement from the from the administration through, you know, regulation or executive action while has its own, you know, issues with litigation and it is inherently temporary. This is what we saw from the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Biden administration, and what we'd imagine is going to be the the major thrust of a Biden second term or a Trump second term. Um, You know, when Congress is unable to do anything, you kind of force other actors to take a step forward. Sometimes that's states, sometimes that's localities. And then sometimes that's, that's, you know, various agencies, DHS, DOL, um, USAID and and, and others that are interested in the immigration space right now. So that's, that's kind of where we're seeing, like, where can there be movement if it can't be in Congress? It could be on something where the administration has the authority already. Right. So I guess that brings an interesting question. Is there a preferred method or preferred way to 
introduce immigration changes, knowing that there is a gridlock Congress and, you know, theoretic under 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 if everything was working correctly, Congress creates the bill, goes to the president to sign. Obviously, that's, that's not the case. Yeah. Hasn't been the case. Looking ahead, well, likely not be the case because mm-hmm. um, you start to get into the idea of, you know, how much power does the executive branch have over immigration? Yeah, yeah sure. The preferred method is legislative. The House passes it. The Senate passes it. It goes to the it goes to the White House. That is what that's you know the Holy Grail. That's what we're all interested in. Obviously, we have in past major immigration reform since since the nineties, and we got close in in two thousand and two thousand seven, two thousand thirteen, two thousand eighteen, and we kind of go down the list twenty twenty two, and and maybe we are close to to it right now. Um, but we've you know that has evaded us so far. That is the the superior method. Uh, you know, what we saw from the uh, uh, Trump administration was a flurry of, of executive actions, the highest number of executive actions on immigration uh, ever. Uh, that is going to be eclipsed by the Biden administration who came in and undid most of those things on, you know, day one or year one or, or you know, uh, up until today. Um, and, you know, if if President Trump wins again, he's going to come in and reverse everything that that President Biden did. And so we get into this this. It's almost like a tick for tap, yeah tap yeah tap. we're we're stuck in this cycle where everything is temporary mm-hmm. um, there's just mass uncertainty uh, in in what um, you know practitioners and immigrants are, are are facing when it comes to what are the you know programs and policies that are in place it's no way to run an immigration system um, but that is that is what we're left with given a gridlock Congress and so that is one of the reasons we are you know we put a lot of effort in trying to work on Capitol Hill because really getting something through in a bipartisan way is the only way to make the kind of generational lasting change to modernize all of these systems and all these programs to add a startup visa, to do all these things that we're interested in. Um, Without that, we kind of have these reinterpretations of existing authorities and we have these new ideas and we have litigation that is ongoing. I mean, we are, you know, we're still in the midst of DACA litigation. Mm-hmm. Um, DACA, which comes out of, of uh, the Obama administration after Congress failed to do something on immigration. And then the Trump administration got rid of DACA and it's been litigated ever since. We expect, uh, I'm not a lawyer and I won't speak uh, for the lawyers on our team, but we expect that to come in front of the Supreme Court for next year. Um, and I think you talk to people and say that, oh, yeah, DACA could be overturned by the Supreme Court. And people are like, again, like yeah. still like, you know, DACA is now celebrated at what, 11 years, um, 20. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it could be overturned next year. And um, so this is no way to run an immigration system. And Congress needs to kind of get its act together and, yeah. and pass something. So the lack of action from Congress, how has how is that impacting the healthcare industry as a whole? Yeah, I, I think that there was a lot of peak interest during COVID and people started to think about Congress could act on immigration and, and that could help the healthcare industry. And it's not that they did nothing, but the there's still a lot to be done. But I think that healthcare provides a unique opportunity right now. Um, it's still something that garners a lot of bipartisan support. And so we do go to the Hill and talk about healthcare as an avenue for legislative action. But of course, in the interim, while Congress has refused to act and and while these other things can be litigated again and again, you know, we see that the healthcare industry is continuing to experience ongoing shortages that while they can be statistics on a piece of paper, ultimately it's Americans that are suffering because Mm -hmm. they have to wait months for a doctor's appointment because if they live in rural America, they might not have a doctor or very many doctors in their vicinity or they have to wait longer or the maybe the doctor spends fewer amount a shorter amount of time with them Mm -hmm. so ultimately it's the americans that are suffering as a result of congressional inaction on this yeah yeah do you in in your studies and just in in talking with other folks in niskanen and on the hill do you are you seeing a cycle potentially or foresee a cycle um i believe the the international student population coming to the U.S. has been declining, um, and compared to pre-pandemic levels, I still I think it's like still ten percent below. Um, there's a lot of factors going into that. COVID obviously had a big impact. Mm-hmm. Trump administration mm-hmm. big impact. If international students aren't coming into the U.S. to study, potentially, you know, in, in the medical field, is that is it almost like a cycle of lower healthcare practitioners? 
Yeah, so I think there's another component there also that I'll mention. But, you know, yes, international students in most every sought after field, you know, are overrepresented. And that's important because international students are an incredibly essential part of our higher education population. They are individuals who invest a ton into the U.S. economy. And, and this is really beneficial for us. Uh, we have briefly talked about previously in some of our work about how medical doctors and um, doctors of osteopathy are not listed on the STEM OPT list, which is a list of occupations for which they can stay after graduation yeah. for up to three years versus a singular year for any other occupation or any other field of study. And this is really important because every medical doctor, an important part of their studies is completing residency. Mm -hmm. And even just to become an internist or an internal doctor, you have to complete three years of residency at a minimum and then for a specialty beyond that. So even if someone comes here to study for uh, medical school in the U.S., if their medical degree does not qualify them for STEM OPT for three years of work authorization after the completion of their studies, then maybe they complete one year of residency here or maybe they decide I'm not going to start my residency and then leave. And um, they end up pursuing opportunities elsewhere to complete their residency and probably get a job offer out of it. And everybody's clamoring for doctors, so everybody's happy to take them in. But what we have also seen is research shows that International students came at an increased rate to study STEM occupations after the introduction of STEM OPT. So STEM OPT, not only by not including medical doctors or medical fields on the qualifying majors for this, it not only is a deterrent for individuals who are already here to stay, but also it's a deterrent for individuals who are considering studying here. So I think that the retention of international students and our ability to provide doctors for the next generation, they're inherently connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I, I would add that U.S. policy doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And so when, right. when other countries are truly rolling out the red carpet and saying, you know, we will, uh, for our international, you know, graduates, we're going to provide a pathway to citizenship and, and we're going to provide, you know, benefits and, and the opportunity for, for a spouse to, to come to the U.S., to come to, you know, the country, um, that is all happening while our international student numbers still have not have not recovered, mm -hmm. you know, post COVID. Um, and so what we need to do is, you know, realize that we have this amazing advantage uh, of people knowing that you can come to the U.S., you have world class institutions um, and this is the place to be. But you mentioned the U.K. earlier. There's Canada. There's there's so many other places that you can go and study and kind of have a better suite of immigration benefits included. Right. Um, and, and we just need to like, you know, uh, kind of meet the moment and yeah. recognize that our policy needs to change as other policies have changed. Yeah. I mean, just like, yeah, I mean, just in, uh, breaking it down, you international student comes here on the F1 and then they could either work or, you know, if they get OPT, but then they don't know if they're going to be selected in the lottery and kind of, yeah. Whereas Canada, I believe, lays out the plan from student visa to permanent residency. You know what you need to do. Yeah. Um, real final question on on uh, healthcare, uh, Matthew. You mentioned something a few minutes ago uh, that you were working on piece of legislation, or I'm, I'm forgetting the name of on it. On the Conrad. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, do you want to give an overview on Conrad and then I'll, I'll speak to the, the politics? Sure. So Conrad 30 is a program that allows states to, they have up to 30 waivers and they can provide it to international medical graduates who are maybe here uh, doing research or completing their residency or whatever it may be. And usually those individuals are on the J-1 visa that we discussed a little bit earlier, not working as au pairs, but another type of J-1. And usually the J-1 requires them to go to their home country or work abroad for a period of time um, after their completion before they are eligible to come back to the U.S. with another type of visa. And this is a bit difficult for the U.S. if we have these really talented and um, necessary people here, uh, especially in areas that have a shortage of doctors or a shortage of residents, and we know how much res how influential residents are and able to care for a wide population. However, uh, these countries or these states, each state has 30 waivers, 
and they can utilize them in order to offer positions for up to 30 international medical graduates to come and work in their state in an underserved medical area. So areas that don't have enough doctors or are impoverished or otherwise have barriers to accessing medical care, each state can offer 30 international medical graduates the ability to come to their state and waive their requirement to leave the country. And so this is really beneficial for the U.S. We go, they go specifically to the places that need them most, and they, we are able to keep them here. And um, we've had great success through the program, even though it's small, um, only 30 per state, like I mentioned. But it's been really beneficial in terms of patient outcomes in the areas that really need it most. Yeah, and so we've seen a, a kind of dramatic rise, really post-COVID, in, in interest around reforming Conrad 30 and, mm -hmm. and ultimately enhancing the program. And so there are two bills, both bipartisan, that are kind of building in support on the Hill right now. One increases uh, the cap um, and then creates kind of a, an escalator to increase the, the cap uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the coming years. Um, and then one allows states to recapture um, Conrad's slots of the 30 that Cecilia mentioned in previous years and kind of roll them forward to preserve their ability um, uh, as a specific state to, to welcome or to keep that talent there. And so this is one of those bills that, again, this is one piece of the J program, which is one piece of the larger visa system. Mm -hmm. It's 30 per state. It's pretty small, um, but something that there's there's real interest in. Um, there is like a clear policy case for why this is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, there is great Republican and Democratic support and also support from members in states that are not normally engaged on, on immigration. Uh, you know, those are members in, in more rural uh, uh, states or, or states that have larger un, uh, kind of represented communities. Um, and so we see this as an opportunity in a, in a challenging congressional environment to maybe move something small. Um, and there's a lot of uh, amazing partners and, and colleagues working on, working on this issue um, and trying to get this over the finish line. And, and, and that would be a huge step forward for, for the J program, for the Conrad 30 program specifically. And, you know, honestly, we're thinking about people all across the U S in, in rural and underserved communities that like have the chance to see a doctor faster than they would. And like, I mean, that's just a win for, for everybody. Yeah. So trying to get this over the finish line is, is a big priority um, and something that uh, I, I think I've been rather, op, you know, rather pessimistic this <laughs> entire uh, podcast, but there's some level of optimism in trying to move this <laughs> bill, um, you know, by the end of the year. Awesome. I was just going to say, what do, what do you think? Is, do you think we'll see any movement? But Well, what I always say is if you're like betting on an immigration reform, like, you know, you'd make a lot of money if you've been betting against it for the last like 40 <laughs> years. So I would say if you're putting money up, bet against it. But like there is there is a path forward to like moving on these narrow kind of tweaks yeah. to the to various programs. And this is one that definitely falls under that category. Gotcha. Gotcha. I uh, wanted to shift to another slice of the larger immigration system. Uh, back in the fall, Matt, you uh, authored as part of the Immigration Idea Incubator Series um, about the uh, temporary protected status. Um, yeah. Let applicants apply for TPS and work authorizations in one form. Um, your research shows that in uh, the, the 2023 Citizenship and Immigration Services Ombudsman um, Annual Reports, what a mouthful, yeah, a <laughs> um, devoted uh, an entire section to the TPS program, yeah. uh, of which 16 countries currently belong and about 700,000 beneficiaries. Uh, super quickly, Matt, um, how does the, what is the TPS program and how does it fit into the larger U.S. immigration system? Yeah, sure. So, so TPS, Temporary Protected Status, um, is a status given to those in the U.S. whose home countries, the conditions in their home countries are, are un untenable. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a war has broken out. There is a hurricane. There is a drought. There is some sort of armed conflict. If you are in the U.S. and, and, and you would need to return back to your home country and you're returning to a war, we have the TPS program to prevent you from doing that. Obviously, we don't expect you. Um, um, to do that. And so you're able to have two TPS, which is a two year program, and it can be, um, uh, you can reapply for that program every every two years. Mm -hmm. This is the height of the TPS program. You mentioned 16 countries. I, I think we're still there. We might have added one since then. 700,000 people. It is the largest the program's ever been. And obviously, the people from TPS, we're talking about Afghanistan, Ukraine, Syria, um, 
you know, there's a large number of countries that are, you know, in the midst of, of, of conflict and crisis. And so our program has expanded to, to cover those, mm-hmm. cover those folks. Um, the Ombudsman, which is an interesting office uh, within the federal government um, that does two things. The Ombudsman's office, every time I say that, it's a, <laughs> a, a mouthful. Um, they should change the name, but also... <laughs> People, people. Well, when I was younger, I used to think Ams Budsman referred to something different that I will not say. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure both of you know. So, but when I got older, I was like, oh wait, it's actually like yeah. an important thing. <laughs> so the Ams Budsman will represent and help those who are in the immigration system who, for whatever reason, they haven't had their their case heard in mm-hmm. in a, a you know kind of absurd amount of time. They're dealing with process concerns. Their file was lost. They will help with these kind of extreme cases. Mm -hmm. And then they have a policy shop. And every year they put out a report somewhat influenced by their kind of, you know, direct work with with immigrants and and um, uh, uh, and other agencies. They put out a report on, like, what are the policy issues that we're seeing and how can we encourage uh, DHS to to change, you know, their policies to prevent some of the, the issues that we just keep seeing. Yeah. So they dedicated a whole section to TPS, largely because the program is is at its height, and uh, the administration and you know USCIS is processing more TPS applications than ever before. And there are enormous backlogs, you know, for Venezuela and Haiti and elsewhere. There's hundreds of thousands of people who are in the TPS backlog waiting for uh, adjudication. So they dedicated a report, um, a section of the report to this. And one of their recommendations, which which we've lifted up at, at Niskanen and have been encouraging the administration to move on. It's, you know, very simple. You have a form to apply for TPS. You have a form to apply for work, work authorization. There are two different forms. You have, USCIS has to process both those forms. Obviously, we should just put a box or add some uh, uh, language onto the first form when you're applying for TPS that you're also interested in applying for work authorization. Mm. Then you've created, you've gotten rid of half of the forms that you would have had to work on at USCIS. And mm-hmm. so when they're dealing with hundreds of thousands of forms, then double that because of how many people are applying for work authorization. You're just creating an unnecessary amount of paperwork. Yeah. Uh, and so the Amos Budsman recommendation and one that we obviously agree with is to combine those forms into one form and find a way to kind of simplify the process here. Yeah. Simplify it, simplify it for the for the government and simplify it for those who who are applying, who is country is in the middle of, of, of unrest or unease or some type of natural disaster. They also need to apply for two forms. And like, we're just, we can simplify it for everybody, people in a time of need. And for USCIS, who's pretty strapped with, with everything that they're working on, make two forms, one form. It's pretty easy. I feel like I, you know, I, I, I think that's some awesome research and thank you for, for diving into it. I feel like removing that inefficiency would really help with what we're seeing in larger cities um, and, and their increasing mm-hmm. migrant populations. Correct me if I don't know if they're all coming in on TPS. Am I, I'm not speaking on that, am I? Some of them might be asylum seekers, but um, equally they would also have to complete the work authorization request. So it, they're also submitting a form, yeah. which means that improving the process for TPS holders would ultimately be beneficial for those asylum seekers also who are now in the backlog of getting their work authorization. So if you can speed it up for the TPS holders, then you can allow the staff who are working on work authorization forms to have more capacity to deal with the work authorization requests of the asylum seekers that we're seeing. Yeah, so much is connected. And so a lot lot of our work is like, if USCIS is able to find efficiencies over here, people who are, are, have nothing to do with that program over here would benefit from it. Right. So anywhere that they can find somewhere. And, and we, we want to say like USCIS has, has done a, a great job in a lot of ways in improving their process. And there's always ways for them to be better and for the processes to be quicker. And, and, you know, there's many things that uh, we have uh, written about and advocated over the years with USCIS, but like they have done uh, a good job in our opinion of moving the ball forward on a lot of these issues to help other groups that are dealing with enormous backlogs. Right, right. Um, and, you know, Matt, in your research, you you write that, you know, part of the, TP, the unpredictable nature of evolving disasters, I want to focus on that phrase a little bit, you know, climate change, I uh, I think it's you're just going to see thing worse and worse disasters, TPS programs already at an all time high, 700,000 mm-hmm. beneficiaries. Uh, are you do you think that the numbers only going to increase? And what are the if USCIS doesn't introduce implement this change? Like what are the downsides? 
Yeah, I think that the downsides are continued, uh, just prolonged processing delays. And and I mean, there are instances in which people who had a, a TBS and then reapplied for a second uh, iteration of TPS didn't even get the their answer back before their two years would have run out. I mm-hmm. mean, we're seeing enormous delays that are just leaving people stranded, whether it's the work authorization or not, or their you know the, the TPS which provides them a, a status. Um, so the downside is just continued uncertainty about the future of someone uh, of someone in the U.S. And this is something that we've been talking about when it comes to to DACA, when it comes to TPS, when it comes to a, an asylum system that takes at this point probably ten years to go from uh, uh, filing an asylum claim to a full adjudication. There's just so many people right now that are in this kind of limbo state. Um, and, and our friends at the Migration Policy Institute have, have done a lot of great work on this. So many people who have a kind of, uh, of a legal status for sure, mm-hmm. but, but one that is inherently uncertain and, and um, one in which you cannot kind of build a, a life on. And so this, I, this idea, I mean, we always get back to DACA, which is, you know, su- such an important piece of, of, uh, uh, of the U.S. immigration system, 500,000 people who, who uh, are still, you know, uh, under the potential of of um litigation given the supreme court case um who like are trying to build a life for themselves and may still be told that they yeah. will need to go home a place that they've probably not been in, in right 20, 30 I, this 40 time they're years full, they're basically they're basically americans except yeah. for their legal status yeah yes. for yeah. sure so we're so with tps we're creating uh, uh, another program it's distinct from daca but seven hundred thousand people who ultimately you know, if we're looking forward um, to a potential Trump administration, you know, their goal is to get rid of all TPS. And, and they were they were knocking out TPS um, uh, uh, designations kind of left and right. Um, we're just creating this situation where we have so many people in a kind of limbo status, which is which is a problem. Uh, on your first point, we've had some major like specific episodes of exodus in the last couple of years, you know, Venezuela has lost almost like half of its population. And that's obviously in our hemisphere. Ukraine was one of the, the great mass exoduses uh, and, and refugee flows in the last century. Uh, Afghanistan is on a, all three of them are on the TPS list for, for very good reason. Um, but, you know, a- absent the type of large scale, massive, uh, uh, refugee movement that we have seen from those three specific instances. Um, we we can imagine that the, the TPS numbers might plateau um, unless another country uh, is added. But, you know, what we've learned in the immigration space is you just never know what, what is happening tomorrow. Yeah. And we would have never said in, in January of 2000 and what was it, 21, that Eight million Ukrainians were about to leave their their country, whatever the number was. So, we have TPS as a flexible program because we don't know what the world looks like tomorrow, and and that's a really important authority that the administration has uh, uh, to offer. Um, but the world is there is more movement now than than ever before it's in our hemisphere, and and outside of our hemisphere, people are on the move. Uh, whether that's looking for a job, whether that's fleeing for their lives, whether it's because of climate change, and so our our immigration programs and policies really need to kind of reflect a, a 21st century reality, which is like people are on the move and then, and we must kind of confront that and, and find the opportunities and, and, you know, make sure that our, our policy reflects it. For sure. Adapt. Yeah. Um, well, as we look to, to kind of wrap things up, um, I wanted to give the floor to Cecilia and Matt, uh, just so you guys can, you know, kind of wrap up 2023. We are still in the, in the first month of 2024, mm-hmm. uh, when we're recording this. So yeah, I just want to kind of open up the floor, um, for like a 2023 wrap up. Um, you mentioned the H1B final rule comment. Um, but what else happened in the employment based immigration role or just immigration in general that, uh, you think listeners should know about it if they're not, you know, following yeah, I think actually December was a pretty exciting month. Yeah. Uh, January is shaping up to be as well for employment-based immigration. And I will just highlight a few things. Like you mentioned, the H-1B rule closed. And so I think we'll see the outcome of that anytime over the next several months to see if any of that gets implemented. Um, but we also had the ex- extension of the visa interview waivers, 
which were really important. These are interview waivers that for individuals who have had certain types of visas before, they could opt out of an interview at the consulates, which, you know, it, we're not too far from the time which which a lot of consulates were having 999 day waits. Mm. So uh, this is a really important step and they were set to expire December 31st. And this was going to be detrimental not only to employment uh, and employers who are looking to bring their individuals here, but also for the travel industry and our commerce and um you know, business uh, ventures, this is really important. And so that was extended just before Christmas, uh, before they expired on December 31st. And so the extension of that is really exciting. And then in the artificial intelligence executive order that Biden issued, I believe in, I want to say November, mm -hmm. that it came out, he mentioned that a, an RFI, a request for information, should be issued regarding Schedule A, which Matthew mentioned previously that I had worked on extensively, but it's a list of occupations for which we don't have enough American workers. Mm -hmm. And it gives them a slightly expedited process um, by skipping one step uh, at the Department of Labor if they're coming here on a green card. Um, so for that, he asked that there be a request for information be issued and just asking the public for information about how they should go about updating it. It hasn't been updated in 30 years, so it's kind of like a list that kind of is like a fossil of what our shortage occupations were in 1991, not really what our shortage occupations are now. So it has remained untouched since 1991. So I think it's really exciting. And that um, RFI is closing on February 20th. Mm -hmm. So that we could have some exciting movement out of that on an issue that hasn't been touched in 30 years which I think is really exciting. And starting next week, we also have a pilot program that is being launched by the Department of State um, for the domestic val revalidation of visas. So usually someone who's on an H-1B, if they need a, their visa to be restamped or they need to get their H-1B visa, they would have to leave the country. And with the consulate times being what they are, they could have to leave the country and be out of the country for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And so this is an exciting pilot. We have previously had the ability to revalidate visas in the US. Uh, that was ended in 2004 based on some new requirements. But we're restarting it. It's a small program for 20,000 people. But I think it's a really exciting opportunity to see if we can continue to expand that here. And that can save employers a lot of time and employees a lot of um, time and headache as well. So yeah. there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Definitely, yeah. I was talking with an attorney earlier, and I feel particularly on the H-1B side, there's just a flurry of like news and movement that I feel like we hadn't seen since like 2019-ish mm. or so. So yeah, like you said, a lot of exciting news. Complete aside, and Matt, and then I'll turn it back to you. I just had a complete millennial moment when uh, you were saying that the Schedule A hasn't been updated in 30 years. So I was like, oh, like 1970. <laughs> no, it's 1991. <laughs> yeah, and probably. I was born in 1991. I was like, oh, no. Yep. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I'm sorry for my fossil comments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Matt, what, uh, what, uh, looking back at 2023, what are some things that you would, you would highlight? Yeah, I, I, I want to talk about Welcome Corps, um, mm. which, uh, started in January of, of 2023. And then there was a, a kind of second iteration that came out in December. Um, Welcome Corps is the, the new private sponsorship program under the U.S. Uh, resettlement program. So uh, five Americans can come together, raise money, and put a plan together for how to resettle a refugee. Um, and then they can they can apply with the federal government um, to to resettle in their community. Um, and, and as of December, the thing that I really want to highlight uh, is a, a new program within that open where if you know someone that you want to resettle and they are a refugee, uh, you can submit their name to the federal government um, and submit your welcoming plan and you can initiate the processing to bring them to the United States. And so this is the, the boldest new innovation in the resettlement program since probably the creation of the, the modern resettlement program in 1980. Um, this really puts Americans in the, the driver's seat to determine, hey, I have a family friend, I have a, um, I have a, a cousin, I have a classmate, somebody that I know um, who is facing persecution for mm -hmm. their, uh, you know, race, gender, uh, political opinion, religion, etc. Um, they can now come and get safe haven in the United States uh, through Welcome Corps and through a sponsorship program. And so, they're uh, at Niskanen. We are we're probably going to be sponsoring. Um, yeah, some Afghan refugees um, 
uh, at the organization, which is like really, really exciting. We've been doing work with Afghans um, uh, uh, for the last two years or so and representing some Afghan clients. Um, and so we're, we're very interested to be able to, uh, you know, take that step forward. And a group of us are going to get together and, and help sponsor uh, that refugee to come to the United States. And so this is an amazing program. And I, I'd encourage anyone, uh, you know, who's, who's, who's listening, if they're interested in, in moving forward, they can go to uh, the Welcome Corps website um, and submit a, an application. And there's a, there's a financial requirement. Um, and you can be matched with a refugee who's in the pipeline or you can sponsor a refugee that you know who mm-hmm. is currently not in the in the pipeline um so an amazing opportunity a, a great innovation from the state department um it's something that we think it can can really change the way that the resettlement system yeah. operates in the in the u.s the other thing i'll add for your audience um cecilia mentioned the schedule mm-hmm. a rfi if if anyone has uh something that they would like to tell the department of labor about schedule a um, they could do so by February 20th. 20th. So uh, we encourage folks to log on and submit a, a comment and, uh, uh, you know, tell the Department of Labor, you know, how they feel. And uh, they're, they're great ideas for yeah. improving schedule. Definitely. Love to hear uh, what you guys are doing uh, in the, as part of the Welcome Corps. Uh, so props, props to, to everyone there. Um, final question um, in, you know, a minute or less or so, but Cecilia, uh, if you could bust one immigration myth, mm. what would it be? Whoa. That's a big question <laughs> because I feel like there are a lot to, but I, I think what I frequently see is that there's a, that there's total inaction on immigration and, and, you know, it creates headlines that everyone's doing nothing mm-hmm. or, or one person is doing everything or nothing at all. And I would like to say that there's a lot of people in Washington who are very dedicated every day to making progress on immigration. And there's a lot of bipartisan progress that does happen, even if it doesn't happen in legislation that gets passed or, or you know, but we do see the action that is happening. And I think that when I talk to friends back home who aren't into the immigration space, that that is a common perception that, you know, that no one's doing anything and they're just complaining about problems. Um, and I, I think there are a lot of people dedicated to solutions. So that's my optimistic note to end on. <laughs> Uh, maybe Matthew has something. Else. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Um, I guess I'll stick on the on the kind of refugee front, and I, I think I think it's very easy to to watch the news and, and see images and TV of, of people fleeing somewhere, whether that is you know Afghanistan or it's Ukraine or it's Venezuela, um, and you think like you know these are are people that they've they got some of their possessions and they're kind of. Uh, you know, on the run. Um, but w- refugees, when they come into the United States and, and, and after they have been here for a while, speak English, they have extremely low rates of criminal activity, they have a higher rate of entrepreneurship than, than native-born Americans, very well educated. Um, and I think we, we always, like, obviously the U.S. has resettled more refugees than any other country in the last 75 years or so. Um, and we have a refugee tradition uh, that's kind of baked into into the American experiment. Um, but I still think that people, when they think of refugees, they think people who, um, you know, who need like a lot of, of, of help and are, um, uh, that the government must kind of help them, the government mm-hmm. or their local church, or that they need help to kind of get on their feet. I think that that's true. They've just escaped persecution. Um, but those people in the long run are some of the best Americans that we have um, and they're incredibly capable, uh, uh, and and we have a, a real focus and a scan on humanitarian issues and on refugees specifically. Um, but I'd like to kind of dispel notions of like refugees uh, not being contributors to our to our country when they are am- amazing uh, amazing Americans and they are you know not only our neighbors but people who are helping our economy move forward and 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 uh making some of the most delicious food around <laughs> for sure uh final final question what's ahead for Miss Gannon in 2024 uh obviously we have an election year uh later in the in in november but uh between now and then or even towards the end of the year what's on what's on your guys' plate well i guess preparing for a uh, second biden or second trump term is on the uh is on the plate and then lots of work on schedule a and um, and, and issues around artificial intelligence from the executive order, 
uh, lots of engagement on the hill and and just keep moving the moving the ball forward and getting ready for uh, whatever wildness comes from uh, the new Congress and the potentially new president in 2025. Well, Matthew and Cecilia, thank you so much for joining us on on this episode of Immigration and Mobility Decoded. It's been great chatting in person with both of you. Uh, looking forward to continuing this uh, this friendship, and uh, we'll chat more. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks.